Hi, I'm Leif Nilsson. I'm the CEO of Surge Copper. We are listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange here in Canada. Uh, the company's focused in central BC. We, uh, we control a, a very large land package that surrounds um, an area of BC that has a lot of infrastructure. So there's a mine there owned by a third party that's on care and maintenance. Uh, our strategy is very much focused on uh, aggressively exploring this district. There's uh, pretty advanced resources at uh, a number of deposits uh, around the district that we'll, we'll touch on, but um, we're advancing those both in terms of drilling, resource updates, some technical studies, and uh, as we get into 2022, uh, we're, we're going to be embarking on uh, quite a lot of regional exploration, so really uh, turning some attention to the, uh, the regional discovery potential, which we think is, uh, is outstanding. Brilliant. Leif, good to have you on the show. Um, I think Craig Parry of Inventor Capital mentioned you to us uh, a few months ago. We're kind of keen to get you on, so I appreciate you coming on. Um, like, what, what I'd like to do is maybe sort of go, go back a bit. It's a relatively new story. You kind of jumped on the, the, the copper and the green thematic and, 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 um, or, you know, trying to deliver the projects, which, which is great. But can you just go, go back a bit? Cause I think you didn't necessarily start off uh, on the board. You came in as CEO, but and joined the board later. What was the plan at day one? What are you trying to build? Uh, yeah, so I guess going back to uh, calendar 2020, uh, sort of late summer, early fall, um, Surge as a company, like a bunch of its peers in the, in the junior copper space, was uh, you know, still trading with a very low market cap, um, very little cash in the treasury. A lot of these companies had been you know, in cash conservation mode. Uh, you might recall copper prices were, you know, sub sub three dollars or low low three dollars at that time. Uh, but uh, a number of people were sort of, I think, had a view that there was a strong copper market coming. So uh, at that time, I was in my prior role as an investment banker at um, at Macquarie Capital, big Aussie investment bank, and uh, some individuals, as you mentioned, Craig Perry, as well as uh, another guy, Christian Cargill Samard. Uh, had identified Surge as a uh, an interesting asset, interesting company in the context of, you know, BC being a uh, a very promising copper jurisdiction that should have a uh, you know increasingly uh, bright future. And you know, when you look at the district at that time, there was a lot of you know assets sitting around it that were uh, not being progressed in in sort of fractured ownership. And so um, the strategy was, I think. Uh, developed early on to pursue consolidation in this district. So uh, early on in the the sort of new incarnation of Surge, there was a recapitalization of the company. Craig and Christian joined the board. Uh, there was a, a initiative uh, put forward to start to attract new management to the company. Uh, I made a decision to come across as the CEO about a year ago, so January of 2021. Uh, there was a, a relatively big uh, transaction made around that time to acquire one of the bigger neighboring properties called Berg. Uh, and then over the course of, of last year, 2021, uh, we did some additional land consolidation deals, uh, brought on some additional management, uh, and then our AGM, so it's a March 31 year end company, and our AGM is, is in September. And so the, the plan all along was to use that uh, uh, that sort of time to uh, fulsomely refresh the board. So there was um, uh, a number of new people appointed to the board leading up to and at that uh, at that AGM. So it's a, I would say a very strong new board today. Um, uh, five five new people that have you know very um, um, strong backgrounds in, in the business and, and a lot of relevant experience. Cashed up the company. We did a big financing last year and um, consolidated a lot of this district and got a lot of different sort of work programs underway that span early stage exploration to engineering work and, and everything in between that I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, we, we, we definitely will get into. But again, I just, I just want to answer the question because I, I, consolidating a land package, we see a lot of that. We saw a lot of that. We've seen a lot of it in precious metals and, and other commodities where it's, it's just a promote, right? I know Craig, I know Christian, I know John, these are serious guys and they want to do things the right way. So, that, you know, but I want you to, to just kind of confirm that to me and say, look, we've got Berg, we've got Utsa, and I think I'll Seal as well, but and we'll talk about those individually in a second. But what was the profile of those that made you think, you know, we can build something serious here? I mean, what, what have they got? We've got a PEA on Utsa for sure, but it's of a certain scale. So consolidation means what to you? Well, I mean, part of it is uh, as simple as, you know, a, a radius or proximity to, to infrastructure. So there's a lot of infrastructure in this, in this district. Much of it we don't directly own, of course. It's owned by Imperial and they're in the core of this, uh, of this district. But there's, there's obviously components to that that are, um, 
you know, not owned by them or public and, and others that are, um, uh, that sort of, you know, span out from that. So I, I think in the context of a, um, uh, you know, part of our thesis is that there's, you know, huge geological potential here. And, um, you know, I think a lot of merit in, in, in thinking through the pieces of further consolidation in that district. And, and another part is, uh, I guess, another leg to the strategy is just, yeah, just sort of pure exploration. So this is a district that, um, y- again, you can kind of 30,000 foot view, uh, look down, see a big trend of, uh, of porphyry occurrences. Uh, some of the most recently wa- discovered ones were discovered not very long ago. Uh, lots of technology has been developed uh, that's useful in, in exploring these types of districts in recent years. And, uh, you know, I just think the, the uh, degree to which it's been, um, you know, thoroughly and, and adequately explored is, uh, leaves open a lot of opportunities. So, uh, yeah, whenever you sort of see these things where there's, um, you know, an anchor of infrastructure, an anchor of known known deposits, consolidating a, um, you have to draw the line somewhere. You can't just sort of keep adding, bolting on properties, uh, you know, from, from increasing distance, but you have to let the, the geology and the, uh, the infrastructure sort of, sort of guide you there. And I think we've, uh, we've done that over the last year. Yeah, you have. And again, we'll, we'll get the specifics of each individual project in a, in a minute, you know, great, great uh, talk for themselves. But just on the board, it's a substantive board. Okay. You got whatever it is, is it seven, eight? Uh, eight yep. on on the board, and these are, these are big names. Are are they taking big salaries out of this? Because you've also got the management and operational team on here for for a company of you know fifty five sixty million. It's it, it's pretty chunky. Why, why why did you need? Why did you want or decide it was important to start off with a kind of weighty team like this? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, the uh, remuneration for directors is entirely in uh, in options at the moment. So there's no kind of cash draw or anything like that. Um, and then in terms of the overall size of the board, so yeah, I mean, we looked at sort of peer comparisons uh, leading up to this refresh initiative, and it's 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 like you know slightly above average. Um, but again, if you're if there's no kind of cash draw, I don't see that being a, a huge, um, a hugely you know impactful point. So I, I think it was a matter of where did the skill set of the prior board sit when we were restarting things and the new folks got involved. Uh, where did we have some deficiencies and where did we, where did we want to sort of add skills? And so um, that was, that was really the, the process that was undertaken. So the way the board is constructed today, uh, there's five individuals that have, I, I would say, recently joined the company in the last year and a half. I've mentioned th- uh, three of them. So myself, Christian Cargelson Mard and Craig Perry, and then uh, two new additions being Richard Coulter, John and John Dorwood. Uh, and then there's three individuals that had, have been involved with the company for you know a long time prior, being Pat Glazier, Jim Pettit, and uh, and Shane Ebert. And then on the management side, so it's myself and Shane, uh, and then we recently appointed a VP Projects, uh, Mark Wheeler, and um, and we've got a uh, CFO and corp- corporate secretary uh, as well. Right. And how, how have you changed the the model? Because if I look at what was you, there's P8 from 2016 on on its. Uh, and you know, I, I think you talk about three dollar um, copper in there, and obviously at four dollars, it's a, you know e- e- even better. But does that does that model map or what they're suggesting how you tackle it? So does that map to how you're thinking about it now, or do you need to see this build up of these additional assets in the land package to truly make this a me- a mean- meaningful company with mean- meaningful assets because I think that the, the, the problem that um, people expected to get really excited about copper last year and the copper prices are kind of shot through the rave and that's all very exciting you know for four bucks is lovely but the equities did not follow so there's there's a disconnect what what do you think that disconnect is and how are you going to solve it yeah I mean I I can't speak to the uh, the the market wide disconnect between copper prices and and equities I mean I, I think there's been a lot of uh, I mean, we're in the midst of sort of a lot of speculation around inflation and where that's headed and commodity prices are obviously uh, play a part in all that. So um, I think some of the analysts in the business are, are anticipating there to be some, you know, weakening in, in commodity prices over the next couple of years. But the real kind of secular um, bull thesis for copper is, is where you see those, you know, deficits uh, start to hit in 20, 20, 2024, 2025, that sort of thing. So um, you know, I, I don't know if that's a, a key driver to any disconnect between the the uh, ex- explorer developer stage equities and the and the commodity price. But to answer your question about 
the prior study and kind of where we want to go. So again, our, our thesis in looking at the Utsa and Berg district is that there, this is a this has the potential to be one of the largest larger porphyry districts in uh, in BC and by extension in Canada. Uh, it, it is underexplored. There's I think a lot of remaining potential to to make new discoveries. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to kind of put that all under one roof and to go at it pr pretty systematically. So there is there's always going to be the potential for there to be you know standalone uh, project concepts buried within there. The, the PEA and, and project concept that, uh, that Surge had put forward uh, five or six years ago in, in 2016, I think very interesting and a very relevant and germane part to the potential future for this district. But there's a lot of caveats around it that are also important to understanding our value equation today. So it looked at, uh, at the end of the Huckleberry mine life, is there an opportunity to you know, mine some of the mineralized material at the Utsa property? Uh, and have that material processed at Huckleberry with tailings stored there. L lots of, as I said, caveats and kind of bells and whistles around that uh, that project concept. But uh, keeping things high level, the key takeaway is that it's a there's there's capacity constraints to that whole thing. So the uh, the the sort of mineral inventory that went into that study was relatively small. It was about 65 million tons compared to an inventory that we control today of, you know, almost over 800 million tons and with well, a lot of potential to grow. So the project concept that, you know, is, 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 is there to be developed and there uh, that there's a lot of potential around is what do you do with those, uh, you know, those very large uh, additional resources? Some of them are at Berg, which is a separate deposit. And, you know, it's not clear how or in what manner that would be connected in. So there's a lot of, you know, work that needs to be done to, to untease that. But, uh, you know, our view is that this is a uh, large porphyry district with, uh, you know, one, if not multiple, uh, uh, you know, uh, potential projects lurking there. And the fact that there's existing infrastructure in there is, um, uh, is, is something that I think is, is always a, a helpful, uh, you know, leg up in terms of uh, advancing a, a, an overall project area. Right. I, so long story short, it's, I think it's fair to say that the market didn't believe that it's uh, worked, right? It, the caveats, whatever, it, it, it didn't work on its own. And so um, th that's why I'm interested in what you were doing in terms of these other acquisitions. Will there be more orphan or satellite acquisitions to kind of make this work? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure that's a fair statement that the market didn't believe it's. Well, if you look at the share, if you look at the share price or valuation back when that was put out, it, it, it that's what the market thought, wasn't it? Mm, share prices go up and down for all kinds of reasons, right? So the study was put out in 2016. That was like the same year that Huckleberry itself was put on care and maintenance. The, the project concept uh, put out in that PEA uh, was was meant to characterize what's done at the end of the the mine life at, at Huckleberry. So there's there's remaining reserves that need to be, um, you know, mined and, and processed at Huckleberry to create the circumstances that, uh, you know, would be the starting point of that PEA. So uh, the whole district, I would say, has been kind of frozen in time uh, at, the, at the 2016 level. So, uh, and what the share price does is always going to be, uh, you know, a function of market conditions. Can you raise capital? Can you advance things? What's the outlook on commodity prices, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the copper market has been, moribund for a number of years when copper prices are, you know, trundling along sub three dollars. So um, I don't, I don't think you can draw any conclusions from, um, uh, you know, fr from share price action in the, you know, twenty seventeen to twenty twenty period, frankly. Okay, but it's not, it's typically how companies get get judged or, or, or judged by, right? So I don't think it's unreasonable to say that. I'm more intrigued with why what you're going to be, what you're trying to do now with with Berg. In terms mm -hmm. of building the story, okay. So obviously you've got you've got the a uh, seventy percent option uh, there. I mean, maybe explain some of the terms around that before we kind of dig into what you what you've been up to. Yeah, sure. So the uh, the terms of the option agreement are uh, there's two components. There's an upfront payment component and a, and a work component. On the upfront payment component, it's it's five million in total. We did four million of that five on signing, which was about a year ago. The, the remaining million of that five is is uh, two hundred thousand annually over over uh, five years, and we paid uh, the first installment of that uh, just just prior to the uh, the end of twenty twenty one, and then the work uh, payment or the work commitment component is eight million dollars uh, invested in a, a you know very sort of broad 
list of qualifying expenditures over the course of five years. So out of that 8 million, we've completed uh, about a 1.2, 1.3 million thus far. And the schedule on that is uh, we have two years to do the first 2 million and then uh, two, two, two over years, three, four, and five. So we're at we're at the right spot you'd want to be on that uh, kind of earning schedule where we sit today. Okay, and so you raised what fourteen million bucks back in um, June last year. It was kind of funding the drill program. Correct. And how much was raised prior to that? I and mean, what's the total raise on this? So since restarting the company or recapitalizing the company, uh, there was about six and a half raised in the fall of of twenty twenty, and then fourteen. These are gross numbers. Fourteen. Uh, which we closed in June of, of 2021 as well. So, you know, order of magnitude, 20 million uh, raised over the last year. Right. And mostly the management team have, um, and for, I guess, five million friends as well in, in there, but um, got a 14% as, as stated in the in the PowerPoint here. Was that was that an all, I mean, how much cash was actually put in, cold hard cash by management? Do you know? Yeah. So uh, in the, in that 2020 raise, um, you know, a significant amount, I don't, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but it would be probably between a quarter and a half of the, uh, of the, you know, proceeds of that deal came from, uh, from insiders. And then there was, you know, decent participation in the, in the last deal, but the last deal was a bought, bought deal. Right. So, um, there's obviously, uh, you know, more kind of considerations around, um, insider participation in, um, in those sorts of transactions. So there was, I would say, token participation in the, uh, the deal last year. Right. Okay. So we've got, we're talking about three projects um, at, the, at the moment. Um, drill program, you started to indicate that. I mean, we, you've been putting out some really good numbers, right? These, these are more than reasonable grades, they're big intercepts, um, which always is eye, eye-catching. Um, your what's the plan of attack in terms of um, priority between Berg, Utsa, and, and Seal? How, how are you coming out? So, uh, so, so, so Seal, just to um, maybe avoid any confusion. So, the way we refer to it is, is Utsa is, is broadly speaking the project area that sits to the south of Huckleberry. Uh, and, the, and there's three different porphyry deposits uh, as of today on that property, referred to as West Seal, East Seal, and Ox. Uh, separate, separate to that is this Berg property. And again, we, it's, there's, there's a little, there's sort of nuance around it because we've added a bunch of hundred percent owned ground up in that Northern area as well. So not, so, you know, the Berg property obviously refers to the land area that's subject to that option agreement. There's a deposit on there also called, uh, Berg, the Berg deposit, but then there's other, you know, very, very compelling exploration targets in and around there. Some of which we have a hundred percent interest, uh, over. So, the Berg property, the, the Berg property is broadly speaking that seventy percent option agreement area in the northwest of the district. There's the Berg deposit that sits on there. That's part of that seventy uh, percent exposure. Uh, down in the south is the broadly speaking the Utsa property, and on there there's a few porphyry deposits. Seal is the biggest, and that's where uh, the the you know majority of our drilling budget over the last twelve months has been, or you know, fifteen months has been focused on is. Uh, adding to that kind of near resource uh, area at uh, at the seal deposit in particular. Perfect. Okay, that, that that's really helpful. And in terms of you referenced something earlier on, which was with which was the kind of Huckleberry, uh, well, the mill effectively people I think are most most interested in. Um, are there further acquisitions uh, that you're considering as part of this, this consolidation? No, I think we're pretty happy with uh, with where where we are. There's. Um, uh, again, the map has been largely kind of cleaned up over the last uh, year. And so that that district going out to a pretty far radius from the center of activity there at Huckleberry is is largely held between us and uh, and Imperial. So we'll we'll see where exploration kind of points us, right? We uh, one of the one of the big uh, investments we made last year was a big geophysical survey covering the whole district. we did we did that in in you know collaboration with our neighbors at Imperial. And so, we're going to be getting into um, you know more more regional exploration around the district this year, and you know we'll we'll see if there's some additional staking or what have you that that we uh, we want to do on the on the basis of uh, some of that work. But um, but no, I think the you know for where we are on the strategy today, which is we're not trying to crystallize anything yet. There's a lot of you know uh, turning over stones that we need to do on the exploration side, as well as you know from an engineering perspective, understanding what we what we own and what uh, uh, what project configurations could make sense? We need to progress a lot of that, um, uh, you know, based on the land position we have. It's a big land position. I don't think we need to, 
we're not you know starved for for adding more like 1200 square kilometers is uh, a lot of a lot of ground to cover yeah yeah yeah, yeah there's a danger of um at some point that your, your assets become a liability in the sense that you, you need to spend money on, on on these things so with the drill program you've got line lined up you've, you've indicated the kind of where the, where the where the focus is so just in terms of meters uh, to be that you're planning to drill, just remind me of that and um, on the cost of that again. So uh, the the cost when we're drilling around the Utsa area is is extremely competitive. Uh, it's sort of averaged in uh, in recent years around one hundred and eighty five dollars per meter all in. That's obviously you know in, access is really good there, right? You can drive a car to the camp. Um, uh, so there's a whole lot of you know benefits that uh, derive uh, from that, and a lot of the drilling has been in close proximity to that area. So we're not we're not doing a lot of things uh, historic or in recent years where you're you know off in super remote areas where you're relying on helicopter support or you know having to truck fuel in in and out and things like that. Uh, as we get into the drill program next year, we could see some you know cost creep just around some of those aspects that were a little bit further away from. Uh, from camp. So, um, you know, wouldn't be surprised to see those unit uh, meter costs uh, increase a bit. So um, we haven't really, you know, finalized the uh, the budget and the plan for um, how we're going to go about it this year. We're, we're obviously still waiting on some final results from this geophysics, but broadly speaking, there's a handful of target areas that are, uh, you know, of, of most interest to us. And the plan is to go after those with sort of mini campaigns across a, a few different areas in the district. So, uh, for your audience, like rough numbers, I, I would um, I would sort of think around thirty thousand meters split between four to five different areas over the course of uh, this year. And how many drills have you got, and what type of drills are they? So we we use uh, it's all diamond drilling, and we use uh, a contractor, um, a, a local contractor there that uh, uh, you know typically we've operated with uh, with two rigs at a time, and I think that's. Yeah, you know, probably the uh, the starting point that we'll look at uh, for this year as well. Right, and so I know you obviously got large intercepts here, but um, is it rel relatively shallow drilling? I mean, I know it's porphyry, but what what, are you, what are you, how far down are you going? No, I mean, uh, I think some of the deepest holes that we put in this year, um, from a you know not just downhole length, but also just sort of you know the, the Z component of that can get as deep as uh, 850, 900 meters. So. Um, and I think that's been a you know one of the lessons of drilling in some of these porphyry districts in in BC is that y you may not be trying to explore for open pitable resources at those depths, but you know some of the you know most important discoveries that have been made in in these environments in BC have been from those those deep drilling um, uh, those deeper holes that uh, that uncover you know significant um, changes in in grade and tenor and and basically point to discreetly mineable underground zones. So, you know, the area up around Red Chris is, is well known for that. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for that in, in other parts of the, uh, of, of these trains as, as well. So, uh, I, the, you know, it's a long way of saying that I think um, stopping drill holes at an arbitrary uh, depth, if you're still in mineralization is, uh, is something that you tend not to see happen as much nowadays, as much as it was in the past. A lot of these districts have sort of drilled out deposits, but the drill holes are all kind of just stopped at 300 meters because why would you go any deeper than that? Whereas I don't think that uh, logic holds anymore. And so how, how do you, copper companies grow value and, and, and grow, grow as a business? Because like, if I look again, I look, go back to the appointments here, you know, it's a serious team, you know, the Johns and the Craigs of, of this world and, and obviously Christian, um, obviously down in, in Ecuador as well. They, they are miners. Right. This isn't a promote story. This isn't a um, let, you know mine the market and, and and see how things go. It seems to be. But how do copper companies grow? Because it's it's expensive. It's not it's not a you know when you when you get to the point where you're going to need to raise money for building. I know we're at exploration stage. And it's a long way to go. But I'm just you've got to go through a, a a sequence. You've got all these baby steps that you've got to put in place. Now I'll be thinking about now if you are indeed. You know, have the intent to be miners here. So, is there is there a plan, um, or is it just drill, drill, drill? See how we go. Yeah, I mean, I th I think in uh, in the in the mining business, in the aggregate, uh, frankly, a, most of the value creation comes from discovery. I think you know, de developing projects and and um, you know, operating them to world you know, world class standards is perhaps more accurately described as value extraction, but I think a lot of the, uh, you know, the big value creation events in, in this business in the aggregate uh, come from uh, exploration and discovery. And, um, 
Uh, so, you know, we're not, we're not uh, shy about that. I think, you know, a, a big exciting part of our value equation is that potential to make uh, uh, new discoveries in this district. And yeah, there's, there's obviously no shortage of great examples in this business of uh, wonderful returns being delivered to shareholders for companies that, you know, stay at that, uh, that stage of the process. I mean, a couple top of mind examples being Great Bear, which is, you know, just transacted pre-resource uh, and then in our neck of the woods, uh, GT as well. That was uh, obviously they had put out an initial resource, but it was sort of pre-PEA. So I don't think there's any kind of a priori um, reason in this business to, uh, you know, have forecasts or predict the future that you're going to jump from one one leg of the treadmill to the other. And, and um, I, I think the the kind of tasks involved in doing that are, are often, um, yeah, I mean, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not sort of, you can't really um, uh, arm wave around them. They're pretty, pretty challenging undertaking. So uh, it, yeah, we're not at a stage where we're talking about uh, becoming a miner or what, what's required to do that. I think we're at a stage where we own, we own uh, some really interesting assets. We think there's a ton of potential there. There's, there's some nice, you know, risk mitigating factors uh, just given the level of infrastructure around us and, uh, we're trying to just get smarter on it and build as much data as we can to, um, to sort of make that value case and, and move to the next level. But it's not what I say. Look, I'm just go back to your background, Macquarie Stiefel, you know, CIBC before that. And, you know, you got the finance and, and I'm from that world myself. You, you look at it with a different optic from a, it was certainly one of you know, the, 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 the uh, geos um, and certainly from, you know, the CEOs of, of companies. So you, you've been brought in to say, hey, give us that one, give us access to your your um, finance world. That's that's got to be you know great great benefit. But you've also got to come in with an opinion about how you tell the story, what the narrative needs to be for the market to react positively. So what are the things that you saying? Hey, we as a company need to be damn sure we hit these markers. You know, so what, what what would those markers be? Well, uh, <clears throat> there isn't like an infinite list of, uh, of of copper projects out there, right? So we're we're all we're all sort of observing in this world that there is a uh, you know huge secular megatrends happening already, and and look to have you know decades to run in terms of you know, climate change thematics, urbanization, what have you, a, bu- a bunch of these different things that uh, you know spell a very positive uh, market environment for copper. And you overlay on that a whole bunch of different considerations around well, where can you mine copper and what are the kind of risks uh, attendant to that. And you know, we as a company fundamentally think that copper in BC is a great place to be. And so if you if you filter the universe further by that, again, there's a pretty short list of, uh, of projects that come out. Some have more challenging permitting uh, you know, hurdles than others. We think operating in, a, in an environment like we're in, you know, puts us in a really good position from that perspective. And uh, the catalyst that, you know, any company in this, uh, in this stage of its development has to go through to add value is around, you know, uh, optimizing resources, making new discoveries, sort of add, adding, you know, higher grade, more attractive things, uh, you know, de-risking the project from a, an engineering and kind of project concept shaping uh, perspective. And, you know that that um, how does that add value? Well, it uh, I think it puts more you know kind of meat on the bone and, and understanding about uh, uh, the the timelines and the kind of scale of cash flows that would ultimately be associated with the project. And let's face it, in the junior mining business, like that we we obviously operate in a in a market where the equities of these things uh, trade in the public, but there's also a very important aspect to that is the market for control for these companies, right? These are these are assets that. Uh, uh, in many cases are strategically important uh, to a, a large market of operating mining companies where, again, they, you know, you can't just go out and, and create new copper projects. They have to be found and, and you know, juniors that uh, deliver the goods on, uh, you know, on a silver platter, putting an attractive uh, project out, out there into the market can deliver excellent returns to their shareholders by, um, you know, through the, the overall kind of M&A process. But where, where's the step change moment? Because I, I can think, and I'm not going to name them, it'll do a disservice, this is your interview, not theirs, but, you know, a handful of copper companies, sub 100 million bucks, right, who are, you know, getting getting good grades, sim- similar grades um, to you, and they, they are all around the world. But, it's the, you know, and I would say, you know, I don't want to discount what you said about jurisdiction, I think it's true, but, you know, they're in equally good jurisdictions. But they just can't make that next 
move, that step change. So what do you think you or they uh, or the market needs to see to move from that sub hundred mark to being, you know, given the credit, being given the value? I I take what you said, that your list of things that you've got to do, and those those are kind of, and take this the right way, those are kind of admin. You've got to do those things to, you know, say you're a proper real company. But what's the the one thing that you would point to and say, look, if we deliver this, I think we'll get the credit. I'm a firm believer that the biggest the biggest market moving things in this business is is discovery. Like value creation in this business comes from the drill bit. Full stop. You look at the biggest or the best performers uh, in our little subsector of the market. Uh, so it's the copper porphyries over the last year. I guess, I guess not naming names, but there's a couple you know high flyers that we all know in some South American countries. They're they're they had sort of trum- trundled along at you know lower valuations or whatever for a number of years, and then what has caused them to be the best performers over the last year? In many cases, a single drill hole, right? That, that can, that can chain, fundamentally change the uh, dynamic of a project. And the, the market's smart, right? The market's able to sort of see what you have. And if you, if you drill the right thing in the right area, it can unlock uh, potential in terms of delivering quick payback and, and making the, the overall kind of return on capital or IRR dynamics of a, of a project that much better and that much more strategically significant. So at any given point in time, you kind of know what you have and you know where you can optimize around the edges. And as you as you refer to it, it's, it's administrative in nature that you have to go through a bunch of steps to, to de-risk stuff. But how does a junior company, you know, really add value to deliver those, you know, uh, really juicy returns that, that, you know, capital allocators in this business, the reason people invest in mining is, is not for, 10% of you know annual returns. It's uh, it's those sort of big uh, uh, multiple lifts, and I think uh, uh, yeah, discovery is what delivers that. Okay, so and so this year for you is about drilling. There's there's no kind of um, studies required uh, for a while. You're just going to keep drilling with the budget that you've got, and I guess at some point towards the end of this year, you'll be looking to um, see whether you can raise some more, whether you need to, or whether you can raise money more cheaply, depending on what the market's doing and what your share price is doing. Right? Is that the plan? So on on the study thing, um, there's a there's a lot going on uh, around what what we, what we would refer to as trade off studies, and then we're advancing some of the metallurgical test work uh, on on these projects, which is which is already at a pretty you know reasonably uh, good level. But there's always uh, stuff that you can add and de-risk around that. So um, it's premature for us to guide the market on you know we're going to release a pea on this project that looks like x and do it by by so and so quarter but uh i think we're going to make a lot of headway in that this year and and um you know it, it, it is potentially a catalyst for uh you know later in the year if not uh, early the, the the subsequent year so um uh, so that is that is something in the cards we're not uh, we're not just sort of running around only doing um uh generative exploration there's sort of parallel paths on both of those and yeah, the runway we're on from a, a treasury perspective uh, and, the, and the budget we're, we're going through kind of takes us through um, a bunch of that. So you got you to gotta be attentive to share price, as you say, cost of capital, where, where market conditions are at. And so we obviously have uh, a range of options available to us and, and you know, we'll pay close attention to that. So uh, as to when we reset that runway and, and reload, it's, uh, time will tell, but we're not, we're not there right now. Yeah, I, th- I suspect, um, again, based on track record of the board, you're not going to have trouble raising money. It's, it's a question of what, what you want to pay for it or what your expectations are about what, what you, you should be paying for that. Um, so you said something earlier, and I'm just intrigued, again, partly because of your fi- the finance background and partly because of you, you kind of stepped into, you kind of crossed, crossed the chasm, as it were, and now CEO of a, of, a, of a mining company, is you said the market is smart. Do you think... The, from what you've seen over the past couple of years, whether it's COVID related, whether it's the the, the advent of um, media, you know, pe- and and you know, Reddit groups and and, and similar, to this I think it's referred to the disintermediation. Um, that the market is as smart as it was. Are, are you? Do you ever get disheartened by market rewarding companies that you don't think should be rewarded? Um, do you think that you know con- conventional rules still apply? I mean, what, what's your take on it all? It's a tough. It's a tough one, Matt. It's it's a good question, right? And as someone who came from the sell side, yeah, I mean, there's just substantial changes to that business in terms of 
uh, yeah, like the role of equity research and, and just the regulation around it. And so, yeah, like the, the seat that I'm in now, you kind of want, um, you, you want people who are, who are not in a, who are not in the company, who are sort of uh, investors or analysts to, to really sharpen their pencil and kind of go out on a limb and try to make a value case. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's hard to get, uh, to get people to, to do that. And I think, um, especially when you have like it, copper projects are, um, uh, on average, they're a bit more complex than simple gold projects where you've got one metal. Metallurgy is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot less variables to contend with than a um, polymetallic uh, porphyry project. So, um, don't get me wrong. I think there's tons of inefficiencies in the market, and that's you know where the opportunity is for investors. Uh, it was it was really more a comment about. When there is a, a well understood situation, a lot of light shown on something, and uh, if you will, like a mature, uh, a mature kind of asset that uh, that has a lot of uh, eyeballs on it. When there is a single drill hole um, put into that press release goes out, you know, hits a bunch of bunch of people. The market can reprice those situations very quickly, and when you kind of go back to it and do the math on. On uh, you know back solving to what uh, what is being concluded, it's often remarkable how kind of clever the market is in terms of, of seeing you know a single drill hole can imply you know this scale of deposit potential and what that means from a, a cash flow perspective. That was that was what that comment was about. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, I guess more of that in the future. We can, we can discuss that again in the future. Um, so it, just in terms of the kind of c- control component, like I, said, I I kind of feel that you're you're in control of you're, financially, you're, you, you, you you feel comfortable. Um, I think you you said you've got enough um, of a land package now and and, and targets to try and, try and make these discoveries. So you kind of feel comfortable um, around that. Is there any aspect of you that feels that, or the boards that feels that you want to or need to introduce like a strategic partner? Cause, again, because it, because it's copper, there's a lot, the big guys are looking at, and you know you've got you've got to be mindful of the fact that at some point you're going to want to attract people. Is, do, you, do you start that process, that conversation now, or is that in a year's time, or is that you know when you hit a resource of X? I mean, what, what's what's that timeline and process look like for you, if indeed you feel you need it? Yeah, there's uh, it's a delicate one, right? There's there's pros and cons, and and they're not they're not too uh, they're not too mysterious, right? Like uh, it's nice to have the validation that comes from a, a strategic. Um, there's a lot of benefits that can be derived from, you know, sharing technical expertise and, and things of that nature. But, um, but you know, there's also kind of inherent conflicts there, right? If uh, if if they're an if they're an eventual buyer of the company, then you know they're not interested in making your share price as high as uh, as it can possibly go, right? So, um, so you got to sort of balance those things. Um, uh, in my in my prior career as a banker, I was uh, involved in um, a number of these things where uh, you know you're attracting a, a new investor onto the company and you got to negotiate the kind of agreements that go along with it and and um, you know strike a balance between the, the the two sides of the equation and and um, so yeah, I think a lot of us on the board of Surge have a lot of experience in that and it is it is something that's uh, of interest to us. There's there's sort of the right time. To do it, and you got to make sure that you're delivering the right catalysts to affect a, transa- a transaction like that in uh, an efficient manner. Um, but yeah, as, as I say, there's uh, there's pros and cons to it, and I think when uh, our view is that our equity is very cheap right now, and and um, uh, these are big projects, and so there's there's a lot of um, you know likely advantages that can come from having a, a strategic on on the register, but you need to balance uh, balance things carefully. I, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting with you guys who going going through the document to various documentation was that you haven't jumped on the um, the, the the green bandwagon the the well, green washing sometimes it's it's um, referred to. Um, you tip your hat towards ESG and First Nations and all the things that you that you that you should in terms of responsible mining, but you you haven't gone full bore. Started talking about the I need to talk about supply and demand, which is always all good. Um, but you haven't gone full bore on the uh, on, on the kind of the, the green or battery thematic. Why, why is that? Uh, okay, I mean, we we do uh, I do make the comment sometimes that uh, so, so first of all, like the the role of copper in those big thematics, uh, it's it's almost consensus now. So um, I, I'm hoping that most people I talk to don't need to hear it from me. But uh, 
Uh, but yeah, like I, I always say copper is, I mean, it's, it's sort of one of the best commodity spaces to be, I, I think in terms of its outlook because of its in, indispensable role in so many of those big, uh, big trends. So it's sort of the, the quintessential electric metal as, as I like to say, but, uh, on the, on the, you know, quote unquote green side of things, well, what does that predominantly mean? I, I think it's mostly around carbon footprints and, and carbon footprints are really around like how much how much energy are you using in producing a pound of copper, and then how much of that energy can you control its sort of input fuel source around. So uh, you, you want to have projects that are ener- intrinsically energy efficient, and then also have uh, you know uh, sort of renewable or, or de- decarbonized uh, fuel sources and. BC as a jurisdiction, it's not just where we are, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of the whole province. And frankly, lots of other places in Canada fit this uh, mold as well. Can- Canada's grid power in large part in lots of areas of the country is, is uh, a lot of hydro resources here, right? So you've got already decarbonized uh, grid power. So if you can connect a project, a project into the grid, uh, that ticks a bunch of boxes. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, decarbonizing the, um, the energy inputs into crushing, grinding, like uh, the whole kind of mill circuit side of things is, is that. Uh, the more challenging pieces of the puzzle to decarbonize are your, your fleet. Um, and so, you know, there's some, there's some projects with uh, uh, underground mines that uh, I think more recently are talking about you know, battery electric uh, uh, fleets underground. And I think it's, it's more, more possible and more, more tangible for some of those uh, smaller vehicles operating in an underground environment. In open pit environments where you got these, you know, gi- gigantic trucks, uh, you got to look more towards the, um, uh, you know, almost, almost sort of like these streetcar setups that uh, we, we here in Toronto are familiar with where you sort of um, are distributing electricity around the um around a pit configuration and you're you're uh, you've got sort of electric uh, motors that are, are connecting in, into that um uh, uh you know throughout the, the the pit configuration and the use of conveyors is another big thing that we kind of point to as uh um something that can defray a lot of use of, of diesel power and, and things like that so as you say we tip our hat to it i, I think um you know having it as the the slogan of the company or the front page of, of whatever is um is maybe not the biggest point of things when you're uh, when you're an exploration and development stage company that's trying to discover new deposits and de-risk the ones you have but um, but I think I think that kind of um, the appeal of, of our project and projects in BC in, in general uh, along those lines is, is a is a big part of why we're focused in BC there's there's obviously some amazing geological terrains that you can um, explore in South America um, but or, or elsewhere in the, in the world for that matter but um, you know, one one aspect of of you know project development in Chile that you, you just start to see more and more articles around is is the water issue. Like, there's a lot of water scarcity in these places, and it's part of it is um, you know the impact on communities that you know everyone's drawing from scarce aquifers. But the other thing is you know if you're required to use um, seawater or, or you know um, water from uh, the, the coast uh, for for process purposes. There's there's more energy intensity associated with that desalination pumping water, you know, a couple thousand meters up in elevation. So, uh, you know, a lot of these deposits can handle that in terms of the the cost structure, but um, but those are those are tricky things to decarbonize. Right? They, they they are. It's quite, it's a really interesting conversation, and perhaps one for another time around the 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 the, the energy investment um, that some companies are going to have to make, and in terms of you know how we are going to we as investors are going to be, hopefully, I, I, I sense from the the the, the slew of uh, consultants being set, consultancy firms being set up to measure these things, the the kind of zero carbon or the carbon neutral um, demands from the, of the funds and investors are going to require these companies will be graded and ranked accordingly. It'll be it's an interesting times. For sure. Well, look, Leif, I'm, I think I've taken a lot of your time today. It's a really good overview of the project one. Like I said, being, being keen to, um, you know, talk to you about and, and, and understand. So, uh, you know, more, more of the same, please, um, uh, th- this year and uh, stay in touch. Okay. Yeah, uh, for sure. Appreciate the, uh, the, the time, Matt, and, uh, we'll look forward to uh, providing an update later this year.